Hello, this is the Lobster Gamer, and we are finally going to be continuing our read-through of the Dunwich Horror, the classic H.P. Lovecraft story, which has been made into two, well, more than that, because there's Beyond the Dunwich Horror. That's also a thing. <laughs> anyway, um, these movies, and we will continue with Chapter 6. <clears throat> The Dunwich Horror itself came between Lamas of the Equinox in 1928, and Dr. Armitage was among those who witnessed its monstrous prologue. He had heard, meanwhile, of Whiteley's grotesque trip to Cambridge and of his frantic efforts to borrow a copy from the Necronomicon at the Widener Library. Those efforts had been in vain since Armitage had issued warnings of the keenest intensity to all librarians having charge of the dreaded volume. Wilbur had been shockingly nervous at Cambridge, anxious for the book, yet almost equally anxious to get home again, as if he had feared the results of being away long. Early in August, the half-expected outcome developed, and in the small hours of the third, Dr. Armitage was awakened suddenly by the wild, fierce cries of a savage watchdog on the college campus. Deep and terrible, the snarling, half-mad growls and barks continued, always in mounting volume, but with a hideously significant pauses. Then there rang out a scream from a wholly different throat, such as a scream has roused half the sleepers of Arkham and haunted their dreams ever afterwards, such a scream as could come from no being born of earth or holy of earth. Armitage, hastening to some clothes and rushing across the street to the lawn of the college buildings, saw that the others were ahead of him and heard the echoes of a burglar alarm still shrilling from the library. An open window showed black and gaping in the moonlight. What had come had indeed completed its entrance, for the barking and the screaming, now fast fading into a mixed low growling and moaning, proceeded unmistakably from within. Some instinct warned Armitage that, this, that what was taking place was not a thing for unfortified eyes to see, so he brushed back the crowd with authority as he unlocked the vestibule door. Among the others he saw Professor Warren Rice and Dr. Francis Morgan, men to whom he had told some of his conjectures and misgivings, and these two he motioned to accompany him inside. The inward sounds, except for a watchful droning whine from the dog, had by this time quite subsided, but Armitage now perceived with a sudden start that a loud chorus of whippoorwills among the shrubbery had commenced a damnably rhythmical piping, as if in unison with the last breath of a dying man. The building was full of frightful stench, which Dr. Armitage knew too well, and the three men rushed across the hall to the small genealogical reading room whence the low whining came. For a second, nobody dared turn on the light. Then Armitage summoned up his courage and snapped the switch. One of the three, it is not certain which, shrieked aloud at what sprawled before them among the discorded tables and overturned chairs. Professor Rice declares that he wholly lost consciousness for an instant, though he did not stumble or fall. The thing that lay half-bent on its side in a fetid pool of greenish-yellow ichor and terrid stickiness was almost nine feet tall, when the dog had torn off all the clothing and some of the skin. It was not quite dead, but twitched silently and spasmodically, while its chest heaved its monstrous unison with the mad piping of the expectant whippoorwills outside. Bits of shoe leather and fragments of apparel were scattered about the room, and just inside the window an emptiness canvas sack lay, which it had evidently been thrown. Near the central desk, a revolver had fallen, a dented and undiscard, undischarged cartridge later explaining why it had not been fired. The thing, however, crowded out all the other images of the time. It would be a trite and not wholly accurate to say that no human pen could describe it, but one may properly say it could not be vividly visualized by anyone whose ideas of aspect and contour are too closely bound up with the common life forms of this planet and of the three known dimensions. It was partly human, beyond a doubt, with very man-like hands and head, and the goatish chinless face had the stamp of the weightly upon it. But torso, the lower parts of the body, were tetralogically fabulous, so that only the generous clothing could have ever enabled it to walk on earth unchallenged or uneradicated. Above the waist it was a semi-anthropomorphic, though its chest, where the dog's rending paws rested watchfully, had the leathery reticulated hide of a crocodile or alligator. The back was a pit piebald with yellow and black, and dimly suggested the, spasm the squamous covering of certain snakes. Below the waist, though, it was the worst, for here all human resemblance left of sheer fantasy began. The skin was thickly covered with coarse black fur, and from the abdomen a score of long, greenish-gray tentacles with red sucking mouths protruded limply. 
The arrangement was odd, and seemed to follow the symmetries of some cosmic geometry known to Earth, unknown to Earth of the solar system. On each of the hips, deep set in a kind of pinkish, ciliated orbit, was with what seemed to be a rudimentary eye, whilst in lieu of the tail there depended a kind of trunk or feeler with purple annular markings, and with many evidences of being an undeveloped mouth or throat. The limbs, save for their black fur, roughly resembled the hind legs of prehistoric Earth's giant saurians, and terminated in ridgy vein pads that were neither hooves nor claws. When the thing breathed its tail and tentacles rhythmically changed color, as if from some circulatory cause normal to the non-human greenish tinge. Whilst in the tail it was manifest as a yellowish appearance which altered with sticky grayish white in the spaces between the purple rings. Of genuine blood there was none, only the fetid greenish yellow ichor which trickled along the painted floor beyond the radius of stickiness and left a curious discoloration behind it. As the presence of the three men seemed to rouse the dying thing, it began to mumble without turning or raising its head. Dr. Armitage made no written record of its mouthings, but asserts confidently that nothing in English was uttered. At first, the syllables defied all correlation with any aspects of speech of Earth. But towards the last three, there came some disjointed fragments, evidently taken from the Necronomicon, the monstrous blasphemy in quest of which the thing had perished. These fragments, as Armitage recalls them, ran something like... Nagai, Nagaha, Bug Shaga, Yaha, Yug Sathoth, Yug Sathoth. They trailed into nothingness as the whippoorwills shrieked in rhythmical crescendos of unholy anticipation. Then came a halt in the gasping, and the dog raised his head in a long, lugubrious howl. A change came over the yellow, goatish face of the prostrate thing, and the great black eyes fell in appallingly. Outside the windows, the shrilling of the whippoorwills had suddenly ceased, and above the murmurs of the gathering crowd there came the sound of panic-struck whirring and fluttering. Against the moon, vast clouds of feathery watchers rose and raced from sight, frantic at that which they had sought for prey. All at once the dog started up abruptly and gave a frightened bark, and leapt nervously out the window by which it had entered. A cry rose from the crowd, and Dr. Armitage showed to the men outside that no one must be admitted till the police or medical examiner came. He was thankful that the windows were just too high to permit peering in, and drew the dark curtains carefully down over each one. By this time, two policemen had arrived, and Dr. Morgan, meeting them in the vestibule, was urging them for their own sakes to postpone the entrance to the Stenchfield reading room till the examiner came and the prostrate thing could be covered up. Meanwhile, frightful changes were taking place on the floor. One need not describe the kind and rate of shrinkage and disintegration that occurred before the eyes of Dr. Armitage and Professor Rice. But it is permissible to say that aside from the external appearance of face and hands, the really human element in Wilbur Waitley must have been very small. When the medical examiner came, there was only a sticky whitish mass in the painted boards, and the monstrous odor had nearly disappeared. Apparently, Waitley had no skull or bony skeleton, at least in any true stable sense. He had been taken somewhat after his unknown father. Chapter 7 Yet all this was only the prologue of the actual Dunwich horror. Formalities were gone through by bewildered officials, abnormal details were duly kept from the press and public, and men were sent to Dunwich and Aylesbury to look up property and notify any who might be heirs to the late Wilbur Whateley. They found the countryside in great agitation, both because of the growing rumblings beneath the domed hills and because of the unwanted stench and the surging lapping sounds which came increasingly from the great empty shell formed by Whateley's boarded-up farmhouse. Earl Sawyer, who tended the horse and cattle during Wilbur's absence, had developed a woefully acute case of nerves. The officials devised excuses not to enter the noisome boarded place, and were glad to confine their survey of the deceased living quarters, the newly mended sheds, to a single visit. They filed a ponderous report at the courthouse in Aylesbury, and litigations concerning the airship are st said to still be in progress amongst the innumerable waitlers, decayed and undecayed, of the upper Miskatonic Valley. An almost in Terminable manuscript in strange characters written in a huge ledger and judged a sort of diary because of the spacing of the variations in the ink and penmanship presented a baffling puzzle to those who found it in the old bureau which served its owner's desk. After a week of debate, it was sent to Miskatonic University together with a diseased collection of strange books for study and possible translation, but even the best linguists soon saw that it was not likely to be unriddled with ease. No trace of the ancient gold with which Wilbur or Old Waitler had always paid their debts had yet been discovered. It was in the dark of September 9th that the horror broke loose. 
Hill noises had been very pronounced during the evening, and the dogs barked frantically all night. Early risers in the tenth noticed a peculiar stench in the air. About seven o'clock, Luther Brown, the hired boy at George Corey's, between Cold Spring Glen and the village, rushed frenzied back from the morning trip to Ten Acre Meadow with the cows. He was almost convulsed with fright as he stumbled into the kitchen, and in the yard outside with the no less frightened herd was pawn and lowing pitifully, having followed the boy back up to the panic they shared with him. Between gas, Luther tried to stammer up his tale to Mrs. Corey. Up thou in the road beyond the glen, Miss Corey. There's something been there. It smells like thunder, and all the bushes and little trees is pushed back from the road like they, like a house been moving along it. And I ain't a worse than another. They prints in the road, Miss Corey. Great round prints, as big as barrel heads, all sunk down like deep elephants had been long. Only these a sight more than not four feet could make. I looked at one or two a four hour run, and I seen every one was covered with lines spreading out from one place as if a big palm leaves fans. Twicked, or three times as big as any as they is, head of them head been pounded down the road, and the smell was awful, like what is around Wizard Waitley's old house. Here he faltered and seemed to shiver afresh with the fright that sent him flying home. Mrs. Corey, unable to extract more information, began telephoning the neighbors, thus st starting on its rounds of the overture of panic that heralded the major terrors. When she got Sally Sawyer, the housekeeper at Seth Bishop's. The nearest place to Whateley as it became her turn to listen instant, instead of transmit. For Sally's boy, Chauncey, who slept poorly, had been up on the hill toward Whateley's and dashed back up in terror after one look at the place and the pasturage where Mrs. Bishop, Mr. Bishop's cows had been left out all night. Yes, Miss Carr, came Sally's tremulous voice over the parlor wire. Chauncey said he just come back a posting and couldn't half talk for being scared. He says old Waitley's house is all bowed up with timbers scattered round like they've been dynamite inside. Only the bottom floor ain't through. But it's all covered with a kind of tar-like stuff that smells awful and drips down on the edges and on the ground while the sides of the timbers is blowed away. And these awful kinder marks in the yard, too. Great round marks, bigger round than a hog's head and all sticky with stuff like is on the boarded up house. Chancy says he leads them off in the, the meadows with a great swath water in the barn is matted down, and a stun wall's tumbled every which way wherever it goes. And he says, says he, Miss Corey, as how he got so, so look for Seth's cows, frightened as he was, and found them up in the upper pasture now the devil's hop yard in awful shape. Half of them's clean gone, and now half of them that's left is sucked most dry blood with sores on them like they've been in weightless cattle ever since Lavinia's black brat was born. Seth, he's gone about now to look for him, though I vow he won't ki won't care till he gets very now with her white list. Chances don't look careful to see what in big matted down swath let out of his pasturage. But he says he thinks it punted up toward the Glen Road to the village. I tell you, Miss Carter, that ain't something abroad ain't ought to be abroad, and I for one think that black whale of Whiteley has come the bad end he deserved is at the bottom of breeding it. He wasn't all human himself. I'll I'll ask to everybody, and I think he and old Waitley must have raised something in there that nailed down house that ain't so human as he was. They all's been seen unseen things around Dunwich, living things. They ain't human. Ain't good for human folks. The ground was a talking last night. Ain't towards morning, Chauncey. He heard the whippoorwill so loud in Cold Spring Glen he couldn't sleep none, and he thought he heard another faint like sound out toward Wizard Waitley's, a kind of ripper and tear in the wood and some big box or crate was being opened fur off with this and that and he didn't get to sleep and all till sun up and no sooner till he, he was he up this morning but he he's got over to wait Liz and see what's the matter he he see enough i tell you miss corey this done mean no good and i think all them men folk ought to get up par and do something i know something awful's about and i feel my time is nigh the only god knows just what it is did your Luther take count where them big tracks led to? No. Well, Miss Corey, if they was on the Glen Road this side of the Glen, I ain't got to your I ain't got to your house yet. I calculate they must go to the Glen itself. They would do that. I always say a cold spring Glen ain't no healthy, no decent place. Whippoorwills and fireflies there never did act like they was creatures of God. And these them that says they can hear strange things are rushing and talking in the air down there if you stay in the right place between Rock Falls and Bear Den. 
But that noon, for the three quarters of the men and boys of Dunwich were trooping over the roads and meadows between new made Whateley ruins and the cold spring glen, examining in horror and vast monstrous prints the main vicious cattle, and the strange, noisome wreck of the farmhouse, and the brushed, matted vegetation of the fields and roadside. Whatever had burst loose upon the world had assuredly gone down to the great sinister ravine, for all the trees and the banks were bent and broken, and a great avenue had been gouged in the precipice hanging underbrush. It was as though a house, launched by an avalanche, had slid down through the tangled growths of the almost vertical slope. From below no sound came, but only a distant, undefinable fetter, and it was it is not to be wondered, as the men preferred to stay on the edge and argue rather than descend that and beard the unknown cyclopean horror in its lair. Three dogs that were in the party had barked furiously at first, but seemed cowed and reluctant when near the glen. Someone telephoned the news to the Aylesbury transcript, but the editor, accustomed to wild tales from Dunwich, did no more than conduct a humorous paragraph about it, and items soon after were reproduced by the Associated Press. That night everyone went home, and every house and barn was barricaded as stoutly as possible. Needless to say, no cattle were allowed to remain in open pasturage. About two in the morning, a frightful stench in the savage bark and the dogs awakened the household of Elma Fry's on the eastern edge of Cold Spring Glen, and all agreed that they could hear a soft, muffled swish and a laughing sound from somewhere outside. Mrs. Fry proposed a telephone to the neighbors, and Elma was about to agree when the noise of splintering wood burst in upon their deliberations. It came apparently from the barn and was quickly followed by a hideous screaming and stampeding amongst the cattle. The dogs slavered and crouched close to the feet of the fear numb family. Fry lit a lantern through force of habit, but knew it would be death to go out in that black farmyard. The children and the women folk whimpered, kept from screaming by some obscure vegetable in instinct of defense, which told them their lives depended on silence. At last the noise of the cattle subsided to a pitiful moan, and a great snapping, crashing, and crackling ensued. The Fry's huddled together in the sitting room, did not dare to move until the last echoes died away far down in Cold Spring Glen. Then amidst the dismal moans from the stable and the demonic piping of the late whippoorwills in the glen, Selina Fry tottered to the telephone and spread what news she could of the second phase of the horror. The next day all the countryside was in panic, and cowed, uncommunicated groups came and went with a fiendish thing had occurred. Two titan swaths of destruction stretched from the glen to the Fry farmyard. Monstrous prints covered the bare patches of ground on one side of the old red barn and completely caved in. Of the cattle, only a quarter could be found and identified. Some of these were in curious fragments, and all that survived had to be shot. Earl Sawyer suggested that he be asked, help be asked from, from Aylesbury or Arkham. Others maintained it would be of no use. Old Zebulon Waitley, of a branch that hovered halfway between soundness and decadence, made darkly wild suggestions about rites that ought to be practiced on the hilltops. He came of a line where tradition rang strong, and his memories of chantings and great stone circles were not altogether connected with Wilbur and his grandfather. Darkness fell upon a stricken countryside, too passive to organize a real defense. In a few cases, closely related families would band together and watch in the gloom under one roof, but in general there was only a reputation of the barricading of the night before, and a futile, ineffective gesture of loading muskets and setting pitchforks handily about. Nothing, however, occurred except some hill noises. When the day came, there were many who hoped the new horror had gone as swiftly as it had come. And there were even bold souls who proposed an offensive expedition down to the glen, though they did not venture to set an actual example in the still reluctant majority. When night came again, the barricading was repeated, and then there was less huddling together of families. In the mornings, both the Fry and Seth Bishop households reported excitement among the dogs and vague sounds and stenches from afar, while early explorers noted their horror, a fresh scent of monstrous tracks in the road skirting Sentinel Hill. As before, the sides of the road showed a bruising indicative of the blasphemous a stupendous bulk of the horror, whilst the confirmation of tracks seemed to argue a passage in two directions as if moving a mountain had come from the Cold Spring Glen and returned to it along the same path. At the base of the hill, a thirty-foot swath of crushed shrubbery spread saplings led steeply upward, and the seekers gasped when they saw that the even more perpendicular places did not deflect the inexhaustible trail. Whatever the horror was, it could scale a sheer stony cliff to almost complete verticality, and the investigators climbed round the hill's summit by safer routes, and they saw the trail ended, or rather reversed there. It was here that the Whateleys used to build their hellish fires and chant their hellish rituals by a table like stone on May Eve and Hallow Mass. Now that very stone formed the center of a vast space thrashed around by a monster mountainous horror. 
whilst upon its slightly concave surface was a thick and fitted deposit of the same tarry stickiness observed on the floor of the ruined Whateley farmhouse when the horror escaped. Men looked at one another and muttered. They looked down the hill. Apparently the horror had descended by a route much the same as that of its ascent. To speculate was futile. Reason, logic, and normal ideas of motivation stood confounded. Only old Zebulon, who was not with the group, could have done justice to the situation or suggested a plausible explanation. Thursday night began much like the others, but it ended less happily. The whippoorwills in the glen had screamed with such unusual persistence that many could not sleep, and about 3 a.m. all the party telephones rang tremulously. Those who took down the receivers heard a fright mad voice shriek out, Help! Oh my God! And some thought a crashing sound, followed by the breaking off the exclamation. And there was none, nothing more. No one dared do anything, and no one knew till morning whence the call came. Then those who had heard it called everyone on the line and phoned only the Fries did not reply. The truth appeared an hour later when a hastily assembled group of armed men trudged out to the fry place at the head of the glen. It was horrible, yet hardly a surprise. There were more swaths and monstrous prints, but there was no longer any house. It caved in like an eggshell, and amongst the ruins nothing living or dead could be discovered. Only a stench and a terror stickiness. The elm of fries had been erased from Dunwich. And uh, we will leave off there for the time being. There are three more chapters of this, uh, but they are uh, fairly long. We'll, next time, uh, we will try to complete the Dunwich Horror. It's a long story. It's probably one of the longer ones that um, Lovecraft wrote. He had a few that were of a short novella format. I you know, can't remember I, th uh, I can't remember the specific names of it anymore. But we, we can maybe read those someday, too. But there's quite a few of these that um, we will, you know, uh, tackle and like I said uh, earlier I don't know if there's any specific uh, Lovecraft stories you want to hear um, read in this fashion please uh, post in the comments and I will be happy to do that we will see you later